Cyber Questions is covering the CompTIA Network Plus N10-006 exam. We're going to walk through the objectives one by one and really cover those the scope of those objectives. We're looking at objectives 1.2 where it says compare and contrast VPN. We're going to be looking at site to site, host to site, host to host. We're going to be looking at the various protocols, IPsec, GRE, SSL, VPN, point-to-point -point, uh, protocol over point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, Taxis and Radius, RAS, which is a Windows type environment, web services, unified voice services, and on the CompTIA objectives, it just calls it network controllers, but further investigation found out it's really done with wireless network controllers. In these objectives coverage, there are times when I will vary off the objectives because I feel like you need to understand this more. But for the most part, this series of lectures is going to stay right to the objectives. VPN is the number one way of securely allowing communications from a local area network to a local area network through the internet. It used to be we had dedicated lines between, let's say this was a local area network, this was an office in Orlando, and over in another area of Orlando we had another office. Normally we would have a, T1, a dedicated leased line. Those environments have really gone away for the most part because the internet, the use of the internet is so much cheaper. But because it is the internet, they want a secure tunnel encrypted connection between one site and the other. If you wanted a highly secured connection between site A and site B, let's say you had a, an office in Orlando and one in Miami, you could buy a leased line and that's about as secure because the only person that can see that line is you and your company. Because the internet is so much cheaper to use, uh, they want to be able to use the internet but to keep their data secure between one location and another. VPN has really stepped up and taken over that role. There are three variations that the CompTIA is going to ask you to know and that's site to site, in other words one location to another. Host to site, in other words you've got a PC at home and you want to connect to your local area network securely across the internet. Then host to host, and we'll talk about this, pretty unique. Host to site is the most common way we use VPNs. In other words, we're going to take clients that are at home, uh, mobile phones, laptops, desktops, and this business user needs to VPN through the internet, through the corporate firewall, through a VPN concentrator, and then have access to servers, SQL databases, etc. within their company. So this is a very common, most common way of using VPN. VPN concentrators are very expensive because they have to do encryption and decryption on the fly for all the traffic that's coming from all the hosts as they come back through the firewall. Here's an example of some VPN concentrators. You can see they're pretty expensive. They usually are based, some of the price of, the, of your concentrators are basically on license. How many people are going to VPN in into this device? Another thing to consider is the, is the bandwidth. Because you're encrypting data and decrypting data on the fly, you have to have a lot of sophisticated mathematical processing that goes on inside these devices. So they generally are limited to a certain amount of speed as you want to move lots of people through a high bandwidth connection your prices are going to go up sub substantially. There are some home routers that allow you to VPN into your home which is a good secure way. The problem is they don't have the sophisticated hardware to encrypt and decrypt and what happens is you lose about half of your bandwidth. So when you when they do allow you to use VPN which many of them do not but some of them the high-end products may there you're going to take a hit on your bandwidth. There is a type of VPN called host to host and basically it's one device to another device using a VPN system. Typically IPsec is involved. I didn't find a lot of examples of host to host. I did find that OpenVPN which is a popular product out there does support host to host. I did find some articles on IBM that allows their IBM servers to connect host to host but I don't think it's used a lot 
as much as host to site and site to site type VPN. This objective requires you to contrast, compare and contrast protocols. So we're going to look at various protocols used by VPN, IPsec, GRE, SSL, and point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. IPsec is probably the most popular protocol used for encrypting uh, the tunnel for VPN. It is uh, L2TP and IPsec are the basis for IP6, so it's very popular, it's well established. It's relatively easy to set up, although there's lots of controversy on that. There's, there's a lot of um, painful articles out there saying that it can be difficult. It's considered very secure. It's available on most operating systems. One of the disadvantages to IPsec is it uses UDP port 500, which if you're going through NAT, uh, network address translation firewalls, that can be a problem, such as a home firewall that doesn't have a NAT that's capable as using really port address translation. It could be, there's suspicion that it might be compromised by NSA. GRE is another protocol used for, for a, creating a tunnel you can secure it with IPsec, but you don't have to. Normally, it's a layer three protocol. It, it, it's very uh, popular because it allows multicasting, it allows sub, subnet information, routing protocols can route through it. So it's a little bit more uh, flexible in site to site. By itself, it is not secure. So you must add, uh, say, IPsec with it in order to get encryption. Another popular protocol for VPN is SSL, Secure Socket Layer. It, it can be used with a standard browser, so you can actually build it into a normal web browser so a user can access a corporate network through a web browser. It does not require the installation of a spe special software client on the end user's computer. It is NAT friendly. But just to give you an idea, a Barracuda appliance, a concentrator that uses SSL for 450 users was about $6,000. So if you want some serious appliances to allow SSL VPN, it's pretty expensive. OpenVPN is free and open source. So there is some products out there that you could probably ramp up on a Linux server and use a Linux box to do it. There is one of the cons is complex setup. So that's one of the disadvantages. So here's an example that I use at work. This is a, notice I'm on HTTPS, which is using SSL. And I'm actually, uh, I have a log on for uh, OCPS VPN. And if I have my right credentials, I can. And so here's an example of a web browser that is allowing me in through a VPN service. So this is also very common. I could get access to web servers within the LAN. I could get access to files, uh, things of that nature. So here is how we can get users into a corporate network using an SSL VPN connection and actually using a web browser. No client is required and a user could access things that they needed in the corporate environment. This is Cisco's AnyConnect secure mobile client. So this is another way that I can get into a corporate environment. You can install a client software, and this allows you to go from host to site. And this is what I use to connect. Point-to-point -point tunneling protocol is probably very popular. It has very low computational overhead. It's available on almost any operating system, including mobile phones. It uses Microsoft's CHAP version 2 as the authentication system. It's easy to set up. It's probably the easiest VPN system there is. It, some of the drawbacks are it uses 128-bit encryption keys. It has been hacked at one point, but patched. Uh, there is a great deal of concern that it has probably been, been compromised by NSA. So let's look and compare and contrast TACAS and RADIUS. When you VPN into a, a VPN concentrator, or you're using SSH, or you're using SSL, we want to somehow authenticate, authorize, and account for your behavior within the local area network. These are typically done by what are known as AA servers. There are open source AA servers, and then there are Cisco-based AS, a 
think they're called ACS servers. There are two protocols very popular out there that do the job of allowing the VPN client to connect to the VPN concentrator and then going out to somebody who will authenticate, authorize, and keep track of what's going on. Those That protocol from the VPN concentrator to the AA servers is called RADIUS. There is a Cisco proprietary version called TACS Plus. It used to be called TACS, and it was it was a protocol that was modified and given enhanced capabilities so that it could do some of the things that RADIUS does. RADIUS is open source. Uh, you, a lot of vendors uh, create RADIUS servers. Microsoft actually has something like that. Uh, RADIUS is the protocol that accesses these author authentication, authorization, and accounting servers. So this could be Active Directory. This could be a Unix box. It could be whatever. So RADIUS uses these UDP ports. It encrypts only the password field, and it is used primarily for uh, connecting you to an AAA server. TechS Plus is used mainly for device administration, so it's a little bit different than RADIUS. It is a protocol. It uses port 49, TCP 49. It encrypts the entire payload. It does have the ability to talk to AA servers. From my reading, RADIUS and TACS are a little bit different. Cisco has added some features to this protocol so that it can do some of the things that RADIUS does, but they are slightly different in how they behave. RAS is another term that we're going to learn in the Network Plus objectives. RAS is an older term used for a variety of services provided by Microsoft Server Operating Systems. With RAS installed on an older Microsoft Operating System server, you could get VPN, you could get direct access, you could get router functions, you could get NAT functions and firewall functions. Today, Microsoft, for their newer operating systems, 2012, 2012 R2, call it Routing and Remote Access Service. So it's changed its name slightly with its newer products. So if you're a Microsoft shop, you could use RAS for VPN. Web services is a fascinating concept that allows different applications from different sources to communicate with each other without time-consuming custom coding because everything is done in XML. So let's say you've got a Windows 10 PC and you're connecting to a Linux Apache server over here. They have a proprietary database, a proprietary application with a web front end. What makes this so amazing is your operating system is totally different from the server but because of web services and XML, we can pass information from one, uh, your Windows Explorer browser, to a very different type of application on the web server, all using XML. What makes XML so fascinating is that it is a language, a markup language, that defines a set of rules for encoding documents in a format that is both human readable and machine readable. You can actually look at this XML code here and you can actually, a, a, a programmer, can look at this and read it and understand what is going on. It is also easily read by machine code. This is a huge subject. It's called Unified Voice Services. There are many vendors involved. Cisco, AT&T, CenturyLink, Unify, Microsoft's Link software, Via, Siemens, Mintel, Shortel, IBM, all are a part of this idea of unified voice services, where we're combining telephone, voice over IP, instant messaging, interactive whiteboards, voicemail, email, SMS, and fax, and integrating that all into one package. So here are some of Microsoft's latest products, and it's called Skype for Business, and it's really taking over that unified communication system where you can get meetings, calls, whiteboards, integrates with Office, your email, security, etc. So this is some of the stuff that's happening. Cisco's product is called Jabber, and they also combine that with WebEx, and so you have all this incredible collaboration tools that you can use together. Last of the compare and contrast was network controllers. These are wireless devices, uh, rack-mounted devices that allow you to 
connect or in control and manage and monitor all of your access points within a company from a central location. So you can open up a web browser and actually see what's happening with all your access points on your LAN. There are many companies that have this. This is the Aruba 77210. This is the Cisco 5520. They allow you to manage lots and lots of access points. Uh, this is very, very popular with enterprise. So here we are in a wireless controller. Uh, this is, allows you to see all my access points and you can see the ones that are up down here. You can see the ones that are down. We can go take a look at uh, what is happening on our network. This is allowing me to see all the various, here I can see all the controllers. I can uh, choose which one I want to look at. So this gives you an idea of what's happening on your network from one interface. It allows me to see what's going on, what's the name of the access point, IP address, etc. And you can drill down and get more information about each one. So this gives you, this is the kind of uh, features of a wireless controller. Here's an example of where I can actually look at unclassified rogue access points. So I can look at what their names are, what their MAC address are, what channel they are. So if they're a rogue access point that can be visible from our radios, we can actually look at those and investigate those. The video from this point on will be questions and answers. And what I'm going to do is have you pause, read the question, choose your answer, and I'll briefly talk about the the answer itself. So I'm not going to read the question. I'm going to let you do that. I'm not going to choose the, the answer for you. But then when it gets to the answer page, I will then pick up and we'll talk a little bit about the answer. So again, the way that I'm going to work the questions and answer session on this video is that I'm going to have you pause at the question study the question, and then resume, and I will be talking about the answer only. So the answer to this question is point-to-point -point tunneling protocol and L2TP. These are both tunneling protocols, and I've, got, I've given you some uh, graphics to show you. Point-to-point -point is a very popular way of connecting from one location to another. It was very popular in dial-up. It was also very popular with certain uh, LAN connections. So you'll often see point, a point to point and point to point tunneling protocol used together. They're not the same, but they're often used. This got the connection and then this built the tunnel. CHAP is an authentication protocol, not a tunneling protocol. When it comes to the OSI layer, the layer 5 or the session layer is, is often whenever you hear a talk about establishing, uh, creating a, a, a connection or a channel, uh, it is always going to be layer 5. This is where SMB, the server message block, this is where a lot of network operating systems use to connect to file systems. So if you're using Linux or Mac or Windows, it is a layer five that's connecting your sessions for file systems and many, many other areas. So it's very popular in connecting. When you hear those words, connecting channels, terminating channels, maintaining channels, or sessions, it's going to be layer five. One last comment here. I have deliberately looked at finding varieties of OSI model graphics so you can see different things at each layers. Some of these graphics will talk about network equipment. Some of them will talk about protocols. Some of them will talk about other types of activity at the seven layers. So I want you to pay attention to the graphics that I often use in these answering questions. Again, comparing uh, Radius with TACAS Plus. Remember Cisco, it's a proprietary product, so anytime you see that, Cisco is the answer. Of all the layers that is least understood and probably the least talked about is the presentation layer. Notice that it's just one big chunk in the TCP IP or the DOD model compared to the OSI model here in this graphic. 
you can see it's just called the application layer. OSI breaks it down into this presentation layer. Typically, you'll see things like it translates data, and that's where JPEG, MIDI, MPEG, TIFF, you'll often see these types of applications talked about at the presentation layer. So this is, again, another graphic that really is good for you to look at and study. It helps you look at physical layer devices, what's going on at the data link layer. These are very important for you to study these graphics. They really help you understand the OSI layer. Let me throw a couple two cents in here at the data link layer. If you'll notice, a lot of protocols are talked about here in the data link layer. A lot of these protocols, such as PPP, I just talked about that, STP, token ring, frame relay, this is typically where Ethernet resides. If you're talking about local area network, we're always talking about Ethernet at data link layer. But in this case, they're talking about WAN. So in our WAN connections, there are things that we also use at the layer two, FF, uh, FIDI, ATM, uh, HDLC, these are Cisco proprietary protocols. So there's lots of things going on at layer two besides Ethernet on the WAN side, not the LAN side. Another topic is a layer three here at the network layer. We can see that obviously IP is going to be very prevalent here at, at the network layer. But notice we also have things like routing protocols. Uh, we also see ICMP, RIP, IPX, uh, BGP. All of those routing protocols are also going to be at layer 3. Notice on the session layer, NFS, that's a Linux file system. Notice we also have SQL here at the session layer. Also you have SMB. This is the protocol used by Microsoft to connect to file servers. When we talked about Radius and TACAS, remember, they, they're protocols that talk to these AA servers. These are authentication, authorization, and accounting. This is a great little video if you want to learn a little bit about AAA. It's short, it's sweet, it's very uh, easy to understand, so take a look at it. The answer to this question is IP. IP is at the network layer. It is a connectionless model. Notice over here the Cisco graphic. It shows that uh, IP, uh, the sender, if I'm using IP and I'm the sender, I don't know if the receiver is present. I don't know if the packet arrived, if the receiver can even read the packet. And on the receiver side, it never knows when it's coming. So IP is a connectionless. There's no mechanism. Uh, it just basically sends it out. It really depends on upper level protocols to provide reliability and things of that nature. So IP is a connectionless protocol at the network layer. We're also going to find at the transport layer, UDP provides, and again, another protocol that follows on the heels of IP. It's connectionless. We'll take a look at that as we go. Again, this is a very interesting OSI model graphic. I encourage you to stop and read it and look at it. And if there are questions on it, come talk to me. A couple things I want to show you was in the transport layer, they talk about fragmentation, sequence of data. Remember, this is TCP, reliable delivery, error, uh, error recovery, flow control, multiplexing. This is all about TCP. There are some multiplexing capabilities of UDP, but it's very important for you to start understanding what goes on at these layers. End-to-end -end delivery at the network layer, logical addressing, this is where you have IP addressing and subnetting, fragmentation and sequencing, MTU, where we're gonna deci decide how big the packet's going to be. Also, very important in network layer is where routers live. They're gonna set up routing protocols. Notice the equipment here at the layer. We've got routers here. We have IP, ARP, and ICMP all working at the network layer. Again, this model does a nice job of comparing the TCP IP or the DOD model over here against the OSI model. It's very important that you study these and start learning what is it that's at these areas.
Another nice thing is encapsulation. Notice at layer 5 it's data. At layer 4 it's segment. At layer 3 it's packet. At layer 2 it's a frame. And layer 1 it's bits. In the answer to this question, I've talked briefly about this, but point-to-point -point protocol is a protocol used to establish a connection between one point and another. It is often used in conjunction with point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, which encrypts and creates the tunnel on top of PPP. Uh, we use this a lot in dial-up. It is also used in certain WAN connections. It's losing popularity. So just be aware this is what makes the connection. Point-to-point -point tunneling protocol is what makes the, the tunnel and encrypts. So the answer to this question was quality of service. Let's take a look at the definition. It provides varying levels of network bandwidth based on traffic type. Let's compare that with traffic shaping. Is a specialized type of QoS where traffic from each host is monitored. QoS is always involved in voice over IP. It is also used by many other, anytime we want to control specific types of traffic, QoS is involved, but you'll always see it involved in voice over IP. Remember, RADIUS is the protocol that connects to AA servers. You're always welcome to pause throughout this question and answer session so you can read more thoroughly some of the additional information. I may not cover it all, but you're welcome to pause and read the rest. The main purpose of a VPN concentrator is to terminate VPN tunnels. So where you've got all of your users, going home or on the coffee shop or wherever and they want to connect back to a secure network they're going to connect to a VPN concentrator. Point-to-point -point tunneling protocol is one of the answers. Remember PPP is used for connection. If you want tunneling and encryption you use PPT, uh, PPTP, point-to-point uh, -point tunneling protocol. This is very easy to use, very popular uh, also, layer 2 tunneling protocol is very popular with VPN. It typically is used with IPsec for encryption. Very popular is probably used for more secure connections than point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. So I don't like the question. As many as often you see questions that I don't really like. Number one, RADIUS is a protocol. Obviously, RADIUS does connect you back to AA servers. So it does do authentication. But it's, it's not a good question. I don't think so. Uh, if, now, 802.1x is the standard that really describes everything we talk about when we talk about TACAS and RADIUS. So it really is the standard that describes these technologies, protocols, uh, AA servers, etc. So when we're talking about these topics and you see 802.1x, just remember that is part of the standard that describes all this. RADIUS is really the protocol that talks to the AA servers. So I don't really like the, the, the way they ask the question, but there it is. Here's a graphic that kind of shows you the 802.1x communicating between the users and the wireless access point and then the radius is passing the username password to an AA server. Uh, the AA server then could go using LDAP to an Active Directory or something else and so you can kind of see the pieces and where they play. So again another question, the answer is TACAS Plus. 